Okay, through the worksheet. Especially because you told me a word meant a different word than black. So the matching, first of all. Marriage. Emma. Um, what letter do you have there? G. G. Marriage is a lifelong union of one man and one woman. Adultery. Ethan. E. E. So, sexual union not with spouse. Pure. A. Better one. What do you have for decent then, Lucas? I. I. I think it's probably better the other way around because if you if you're pure, what do you have? You don't have any faults, huh? So you you don't have any impurities. And if you're doing what's decent, that's what's proper. That's what's honorable. So in the explanation, you got those words together, huh? Pure and, and decent life. So, but they should I think the definition works better the other way around. So it should be I for three and A for four. Homosexual, Helena? L. L. That's having sex with people of the same, having sex with people of the same gender. Fornication, Tyler. J. J. So that would include sexual intercourse before marriage. Um, so that would especially, fornication would especially be uh, sexual, improper sexual activity between unmarried people. Uh, where adultery applies is specifically married people. Divorce, Emma. K. K. Legally declare the marriage dissolved. Engagement, Ethan. F. F, yep. That's the vow, the promise to marry one. Sexual intercourse? Lucas? D. D. The physical uniting a man and woman. Lust? C. Lena? C. That's the desire, huh? The thought uh, for uh, companionship? H. H. Keep company with. And desertion then would be B, where you leave or abandon. True or false? The church has come to realize that sexual sins are not as serious as they once were. False. 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 They're still serious sins, aren't they? And those passages that we read all still apply today just as they did 100 years ago or 1,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago. Sin against the sixth commandment begins in the heart. True. 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 Huh? With the, the thought. Magazines with nudity are all right as long as they're in good taste. False. False. Homosexuality is condemned in Scripture. True. True. Our bodies and the decisions about what we do with them are not ours alone. True. True. Who also? Wait, what? God. Yeah, it should be true, huh? It, the Lord tells us how we're to use that. I suppose especially as we think of uh, the Sixth Commandment and and the, the sexual things, it also affects other people, too, in that way. Uh, evil companionship makes it difficult for us to obey the Sixth Commandment. True. 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 Well, people that are going to try and lead us into sin can, can be a problem. We want to be careful as well who we, we associate and, and spend time with. God created man and woman holy, but sex is something sinful. False. False. Both were created holy, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose we got in the next passage, or the next statement kind of speaks then to where and when that sex is, so, is a blessing and something holy as well. God wants sex to be practiced and enjoyed inside the bond of marriage. True. True. Jokes about sex are okay with God and are just part of growing up. False. 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 Yeah. Uh, the words as well as the actions can be improper. God encourages couples to live together first so they can determine who will make a good marriage partner. False. 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 Uh, God wants parents to have children in marriage. False. True. 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 That's one of the blessings of marriage. Does that mean that every to, couple though. has to have them? Um, I suppose if a couple, married couple, doesn't want children, they might 
examine why. Is it simply selfish reasons? Um, but you know, there may be individuals who just really truly feel they wouldn't be good parents. Um, there may be circumstances too where the Lord prevents uh, a couple from, from being parents. Um, so just because a, a, a married couple doesn't have children doesn't mean necessarily that they're doing something sinful or, or wrong. Um, doesn't mean that they have less of a marriage. But God does want that to be one of the blessings of marriage, doesn't he? So I think just as it's written there, we would say true. Marriage begins when two people get a license from the government. False. False. Well, that's going to be part of it, isn't it? It's the legal part. That's going to be the legal part. But I suppose marriage really begins what? When they make that commitment, that public commitment to one another. That's engagement. It's not really marriage. Well, it depends upon what, you know, that, that engagement's a little bit different, isn't it? It's a promise that I'm going to make this commitment to, to, that, to that person. Um, the marriage license is going to be a big step in that. Um, that marriage is probably going to come even after that, isn't it? When now I probably, in our culture, some type of, of wedding ceremony or service is, is held and those promises are made. God commands people to get married in church. False. False. A person could go to the courthouse and get married before the justice of the, the peace. That would still be a proper marriage. Um, but the Christian is probably going to want to get married in church, aren't they? Because who's also going to be a part of that marriage? God. God. And if you want God to be part of your marriage, you're probably going to want to have a, a wedding service that is going to reflect that. And that's probably going to be done then in church. I suppose you can have a... a church service outside too huh? Mm -hmm. you know at a special setting that would be proper too um, but mm -hmm. uh, finally it's that lifelong commitment uh, that is made to one another that, that binds the man and the woman together as husband and wife and makes that marriage uh, doesn't necessarily have to be done in the church 14 one of the main reasons for marriage is companionship true, true. A Christian may in good conscience divorce an unfaithful partner. True. 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 Remember that that unfaithful. if that one spouse is unfaithful, they've really broken the marriage by their sin, haven't they? And the other spouse could in good conscience then get a divorce that recognizes that. Drunkenness and cruelty are permitted by scripture as reasons for divorce. True. False. Remember, unfaithfulness or desertion. Now, I suppose it could be the case, especially as you start thinking of cruelty, where, you know, let's say the husband's beating the wife and the wife has to, has to leave to protect her life or maybe the life of the children. That husband really has, maybe in that case, has deserted the marriage by driving his wife away where she it's just not safe for her to stay. Huh? That might become a case of, of desertion and a proper, a proper grounds for, for that woman in that case to, to get a, a divorce. Um, but, you know, one or the other really isn't very nice to the other. Doesn't treat them as they should. There, there's a problem there, isn't there? That's sin on their part. But it doesn't automatically mean that they've deserted the marriage, and that that's something then that, that's fine to, to get a divorce. Uh, it may be a cross then that the Lord you know, places on on that person. Husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church. True. True. Wives no longer have to be submissive to their husbands in this day and age. False. And part of that is we want to recognize, too, just what God means by submitting. It doesn't mean that the wife then is the slave and has to do everything her husband tells her, does he? Um, and if the husband is loving his wife as Christ loved the church, is submitting hard? Mm -hmm. No. But God has set down these, these orders. 
headship and submission for the sake of good order um, so that we can all live together in, in a way that is going to be best for, for everyone. Um, so that submission means that they're working together. There's a respect and a love there on, on both parts. Um, it isn't just that the wife has to do what the husband tells her. Um, and so as we understand what God means by, by submit, we're really to submit to one another out of love too, aren't we? Um, in love, it's not just what's in it for me or how can I benefit, but it's a concern for, for, my, for my neighbor and for everyone else. Um, and that applies especially now within marriage, but that applies to us in general as Christians as we deal with others. God will not listen to the prayers of a husband who is cruel to his wife and is unrepentant. Why is that true? Does God listen to the prayers of the unbeliever? Yeah. Does he promise that? He may or may not listen. He says he does. He's prayer, because we haven't studied prayer, we'll get to prayer later on, is really a blessing that God gives to believers and that if you have a big wall of sin between you and God, is that prayer going to, in a sense, get through? No. no. What removes that wall of sin? Jesus. If that person is unrepentant of their cruelty, what does that show? Is that a believer? No. That's an unbeliever, isn't it? And the unbeliever shouldn't expect that God is going to listen to their prayer. If you go down the road and you start knocking on somebody's door and you say you need, need something, can you have the same expectation that you would if you went to your parents? No. no. Maybe that person out of kindness is still going to help you, huh? Or give you something that, that you might need or want. But if you go to your parents with that request, something you really need, you pretty much expect they're going to do their best to get, get that, aren't, aren't they? Because you know that, well, as your parents, they, they have a love for you and a concern for you and I suppose a responsibility. Well, if... Again, the unbeliever who, in a sense, is not God's child, huh? uh, outside of his, his family be, in unbelief, doesn't have that expectation, shouldn't have that expectation. God doesn't make that promise to him. For the believer, he promises that he's going to hear and he's going to, to answer. So that one should be true, as it's written there. Choosing a marriage partner is one of the most serious and important decisions that a Christian makes in his life. True. True. Think of what a great effect that can that can have. Um, no. Spouse is an unbeliever, and now Sunday morning comes. Time to go to church. What are they going to do? No. They're not going to have any concern about that, are they? What's the temptation going to be for you? Same thing, huh? Um, or think of how many different decisions that we make in our lives that are affected by our faith and directed by God's Word. Um, if that other person doesn't share our faith, um, that's going to affect those decisions that you know, a husband and wife make together. Um, so it's certainly something very important that can have either a very positive effect on our on our faith and our, our spiritual welfare or can actually end up being a negative for our, our spiritual welfare. Tyler, good question. Um, I had both, I think, because um uh, there is single Christians out there. God doesn't say that we have to get married either, does he? No. Um, there's you know if the person is, is able to live a single life and doesn't have that, that desire, there's certainly nothing wrong with that. In fact, uh, it may even free them up from certain responsibilities to, to serve and to serve even the Lord in, in, in a greater way. Um, they don't have to be concerned about, about family and, and spouse. So that can, can be the case.
take a look at some agree disagree questions here in regard to the sixth commandment. Marriage is an ancient tradition found in all civilizations. Agree or disagree? Disagree. Yeah, disagree. It's not like a tradition. I guess all people get married, but it's like how they get married. I suppose on the one hand, it is, isn't it? It's found in really all civilizations. It's an ancient sort of thing. But is it simply a tradition? No. No. And finally, God established marriage at creation, didn't he? Um, and so it's something more than, than just a tradition. I suppose if it's just a tradition found in all civilizations, then we're kind of free to change it and make it whatever we want, huh? So, you know, unfortunately our society said, well, it could be two men or two women getting married, huh? Well, God says that's improper, doesn't he? Or if we decide, well, it can be, uh, you know, one man and two women, that doesn't work either as far as God says. But if it's just a tradition, then there would be nothing wrong with that. Sex between consenting adults is fine as long as they really love each other. Yes. Consenting, they agree to it. Oh. So you have a couple who's dating or... Um, where is that blessing of sex? Does God intend it to be used? Marriage. Within marriage. And only there within in marriage is, is it truly the blessing that he intends. The best reason for reserving sex for marriage is the danger of AIDS and other diseases. Why do you disagree? What's the best reason for reserving? Because that's what the Lord wants, huh? Uh, the Lord wants that to be a blessing. And tends it really to be something then that, that uh, brings you know, that couple, that husband and wife together even, even closer in a special way. I suppose you can say that is maybe a reason. I mean, a person who is only having sex with their spouse doesn't have to worry about getting any of those sexually transmitted diseases, do they? Uh, um, you know, so that can be a reason, but it's certainly not the, the greatest reason, is it? We have an even greater reason as Christians. It's sinful for an engaged couple to have sex. Uh, yes. They're not really married yet, are they? Not, not as we would view engagement in our society, would we? I suppose in their case, I mean, engagement in that culture really was marriage. Um, they weren't living together yet. Um, you know, so some of that becomes what really do we mean by that engagement? Is it, is it simply you know, a promise that I make to one extent or another that we're going to get married, but it's not an absolute. I haven't publicly made that promise that we're a couple. It's not really marriage yet at that point, is it? Um, you know, so, you know, too, I mean, you know, sometimes couples get married and they maybe have a long engagement and maybe they don't end up ultimately getting married. Huh? That's not necessarily uncommon in our society. Um, you know, so I, I think we would say, would it, to, to agree, it's, it's, it wouldn't be something proper. It should be... You know, if, if that engaged couple want to wait, well, then maybe they should have a short engagement and get married as soon as possible. Huh? And they don't have to worry about that. That's maybe one good reason not to have an extremely long engagement because of the temptation there. Great disagree. Living together is okay because the two people love each other very much. What does it say? But if they're married, then agree. But if they're not, then they say they're married. It doesn't say that. Doesn't say they're not married, okay? <laughs> kind of implies it, though, huh? Even if, even if that couple would say, "Well, we're not going to be sexually together. We're just going to live together until we do get married." Probably not the best thing either, is it? Because for one, there's a temptation, isn't there? And two, we looked at that passage last week too that said we shouldn't give the impression that we're doing something wrong. And what? And if you have a couple that's not married living together, what are people going to be thinking is going on? Probably they're sleeping together. Huh? That's going to be the thought from, from most people. And so you're giving the impression that something is improper is going on. Agree or disagree, it's better for a couple to get a divorce than to be constantly fighting with each other. 
So they should just keep fighting. Well, like, how? If it's a resolved problem like what or fighting? Is it like, like if it's drunken it's little... and cruelty, or is it like verbalness? Yeah. Yeah. I, like we we like recognize is either one of those what God wants is either one of those good and proper. No. Yeah. Both of them are sinful, finally, aren't they? Divorce is against God's will. That's sinful and wrong. But fighting is as well, isn't it? So I suppose in that case, the couple, if they can't Resolve it. resolve it on their own they maybe need to find counseling um, marriage, marriage counseling um, so that they can work through that and get past that um, and improve that marriage so that they aren't constantly fighting um, neither one of those options though is a good and proper option is it husband is the boss in the family The leader. There's a difference you know. between boss and leader. Difference between boss and leader isn't there. And I suppose even with leader, who's the leader concerned about? A, a well, good the Christian family. leader. Family. He's concerned about the whole family, isn't he? I suppose even when you think of you know, other groups, you know, if you're going out and you're going to go on a, on a trip together with a group of people, and you've got somebody who's a leader who's in charge, He's going to be concerned, isn't he, about everybody else? And you know, let's say you're going backpacking in the, the wilderness. Uh, he's going to say, "Well, you know, I'm doing fine, and most of the group is, so we won't worry about that one person back there who's just beat and probably isn't going to make it another mile. We'll just keep going, huh?" You know, if he's a good leader, he's going to be concerned about everybody, and he's going to have a plan for for everybody. Uh, he's he's really helping to serve uh, everybody. And you know, so a servant leader, uh, you know, again, you have to have somebody finally who's in charge, don't you? Yeah. Um, a good leader, too, is going to delegate some things, isn't he? He's going to say, well, you take charge of that. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't that the husband has to make every decision for the family, is he? A lot of things that his wife takes care of. Well, maybe she's better at those things. And he recognizes that, so he's going to give her and allow her to do those things. <laughs> But he's also going to be working to help, isn't he? David, Solomon, and other men in the Bible had several wives. This shows God doesn't really care how many wives a man has. Huh? The this seems like uh, this resolve question. Disagree. Yeah, that one. I just had. God does care. Yeah, and it it proves. That not that they weren't perfect back then. I think that's one one thing. Uh, just because even men of great faith in the Bible did things doesn't mean that it was necessarily always right. Um, there certainly were at times, um, whether it be David or Solomon or or Abraham, times when they showed that they were sinners as well by some of their actions and no doubt. When it came to their many wives, that was the case, um, and it's also the case that we see very often in the in, with those men in the Old Testament with many wives that caused problems, problems for them and problems for their families, and problems that in many cases we might say they brought on themselves. Um, you know, when God created Adam and Eve, though, how many wives did He create for Eve, for Adam? One. One. Eve. not always the case. I mean, it, it may be that we do what is right and problems still find us. But it is the case, isn't it, a lot of times that those problems come because of sinful even decisions that we made um, or sinful choices that, that, that we made. And I suppose part of that, though, those problems that come is the Lord disciplining us huh? so that we don't continue to do that sin, so that hopefully we learn. 
because the Lord doesn't want us to continue in, in sin and ultimately end up in unbelief and be lost. Seventh commandment. What's the seventh commandment deal with? You shall not steal. So I can put that there on the... Okay, you shall not steal. What's God protecting by the seventh commandment then? Possessions. Our Job. Our possessions. Job. Read. Job. I mean, man. How about I read this one? You want to read this one, Emma? Okay. Actually, it's kind of long. That's okay. <laughs> you already at, off. You already volunteered, so. <laughs> Here for about an hour. <laughs> Emma, verse 13, start at verse 13. One day, when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabians, Sabians attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was speak, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, "The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants." I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, "The." Chaldeans. Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. While the messenger was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept from the desert and struck the four corners of the house, and it collapsed, collapsed on them, and they are dead. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job, Job got up, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground in worship, and he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May he... May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. So Job here was a very wealthy man, uh, lots of cattle and possessions, family, uh, loses it all overnight. But where does Job confess that that all came from in the first place? Sin. Where had it all come from? Who had given it to him? God. God had given it to him. And now God, in his wisdom, had, had taken it away. And Job recognized that. I think that all that we have, how do we get it? God. Ultimately, it's a gift from God, isn't it? And what do you do with a gift? You thank. Well, you thank the person, don't you? Um, do you necessarily deserve it? No. No. Um, no. And that's certainly the case when it comes to all the things that, that we have. James 1, verse 17. New Testament, after Hebrews. perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. 
What does James tell us about the things that we have? It's from above. From above. comes from God, huh? Everything we have again. And God gives as many good gifts. Finally, everything that God gives is, is a good gift. What do you think of all the different things we might have? Uh, God, really, with this commandment, is protecting all of the, the possessions and, and the gifts that he gives to us. Of the physical gifts for for this life. We're going to see what God teaches us about our possessions. What sort? Of, what does He want us to do with them? How does He want us to use them? What should our attitude be towards them? Special reminder God gives us to encourage us in the way that we use our possessions. Psalm 24, verse 1. From David. It's called From David, a song. That's for a creative name. Okay. From David, a song. Of David, a song. But there's a period there. What was it? What? Huh? Mm -hmm. Psalm 24 1. Oh, Lucas, okay. got it? Yeah. Go ahead and read, please. Here is the Lord and everything in it. The Lord, the world, and all who live in it. So everything belongs to who ultimately? Yeah. The Lord. The Lord. So the things that I have. Whose really are they? God's. God's. My clothes, they're really God's, huh? Uh, the money that I might have belongs to God, huh? Uh, the car, boat, whatever it might be, it's God's, huh? Um, that he gives to us as a gift of, for us then to use. So one thing, God says everything belongs to him. Now, if what you have or what you're using is somebody else's, that'd be for the first one. How does that affect how you use it? You don't break it or anything. You take care of it, don't you? You don't break it. You're maybe a little more careful with somebody else's stuff than you are at times with your own, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, and so if everything's God's, then that's certainly going to affect the way that we use it, isn't it? So if God is the owner, what's our relationship to our possessions? Rent. What's that? Renting. Careful. Not so much renting, because we aren't necessarily paying anything for it. Let's take a look at the passage. Matthew 25. Verse 14, Parable of the Talents. Again, it will be like a man going upon a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went up, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his Money. After a long time, the master of those servants had returned and settled an account with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, You have trusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, You entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, Well done. Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come.
come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag said to the king, Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, You make a lazy servant. You knew that I, that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping, weeping and gashing. So here, the master who calls the servants together, who who would that be a picture of? God. God. And now he gives to the different servants different amounts. And what are they to do with that? Go make more. Go make more. I suppose. And what is the important factor in that? Is it, is it how much they made? No. It's that they were faithful in their use of it, huh? They were good managers, or at least the two were, huh? The one who was unfaithful, how did he feel about his master? He didn't really like him. He didn't really like him, huh? You're a hard man, and you're, you know, not really very fair, and I don't, I don't really like you, so you know, I don't want to do anything with this. Huh? I don't want to take any any chance, and I don't really, and. What happens? Well, he's condemned and ultimately thrown out. Huh? Um, so, God gives to us different amounts, uh, different gifts and abilities, but what does he want us to do with it? He wants us to use it in a way that glorifies him, uh, that, uh, a way that is faithful. And we're going to look as we go through this lesson at some of the different ways that God wants us to use the things that he gives to us. And I suppose included in that as well, here we're talking about physical things. But it also includes the spiritual things he's given to us. Huh? We want to make use as well of, of his, his word and sacraments. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 2. So those whom God has given things to, here he's speaking specifically or more, more about the gospel than he is necessarily physical things, but again, it applies to physical things. What does God want? What does he say is needed there, the things that he entrusts to us? To be faithful. What does it mean if you're faithful? You do it. Like you say it and you do it. You say it, you're going to do it. I suppose if you... Your parents give you a list of chores to do, and you're faithful in doing them. You do it. How do you do them? Without right complaint. Away. Without complaint, you do them right away. You do them as as well as you can. You know, if they say, "Well, these this needs we're going going to be gone for the evening, and this needs to be be done by the time we get back." Faithful doesn't mean that I wait until oh I see their car lights coming down the drive, and how I quit trying and get it done in, in, in some way so that at least it, it sort of looks like I tried. Huh? <laughs> Faithful means that I, I do it to the best of my ability in, in, a, in a timely yeah, way. So God wants us to be faithful in using ways. So if God's the owner, I suppose in many ways we might think of ourselves as the managers or the caretakers or the stewards. They're all really picturing the same thing. And we're responsible then to God. And look at that. If you're in charge of if you're in charge of you know, a store, you're the manager of it. You're not the boss. You're not the boss. You're not the owner. And if you don't do a very good job of managing that store and you're losing money, 
and things are disorganized, what's probably going to happen to your job? You're going to get fired. You're going to get fired. Or maybe at the very least, maybe you get demoted, huh? Um, now you're not going to be the manager anymore, but you got to go back to being the, the person who socks the shelves, huh? Um, but so God wants us to be faithful. Um, but we're the managers. We're the stewards. A steward is somebody who takes care of something. Yeah, down, Lucas. How does God give us our possessions? Deuteronomy 8. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Joshua, very good. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. Emma? Uh, you may say it to yourself, my power and strength my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant which he swore to your forefathers as it is today. So how does God provide for us there as you look at those verses? He gives us the ability so that we can go out and work and earn a living, huh? Uh, no. Suppose the farmer has to plant the seed and harvest the, the crop. God allows him to do that, but ultimately it comes from God, doesn't it? Um, God gives us our gifts and abilities, gives us the strength that we need, so for and can go out and through what we would maybe say natural means provide for that. Huh? But ultimately it's still coming from God, isn't it? Genesis. First of all, 32 verses 9 and 10. Two, nine and ten, Ethan. Then Jacob prayed, O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, Go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown to your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I have become two camps. What did Jacob recognize about all that he had? Now he had a big family and he had all these herds and flocks. Where did it come from? God. Now over the years, Jacob had worked hard for his, his uncle to, to earn that, but he recognized it was God's blessing and, and that God had given it to them. Next chapter, 33, verses 10 and 11. Lucas. No, please. I have found favor in your eyes. Accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Now that you have received any favor with please accept the present that was brought to you for God has been gracious to me and I have only all I need and because 
Esau. Again, Jacob here now is giving something to his brother Esau as they make peace. But again, where does Jacob recognize that that all came from? God. God. God's blessed me, and I have more than I need, and I'm taken care of, and I want to, to share some of that with you because of, of how richly God has blessed me. So Jacob recognized that all that he had was from, from the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Elena? Uh, okay. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. We hear that some among you are idle and destructive. They are not busy, they are body, busy bodies. Such people will leave the command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the food there. What does Paul say there that person should do? Uh, work for their food. Work. So... God promises to take care of me. Should I expect that if I just lay around on my couch all day that I'm going to have everything I need? No. God wants me to go out and use the, the abilities and the gifts that he's given me to work and, and to, to earn that living. That's the way that God normally provides. Genesis 23. Tyler, sixteen, let's read three through eighteen. Sixteen, seventeen, and eighteen. Abraham obeyed the Ephron's, Ephron's parents and waited out for him the price he had named in the hearing of the Hittites, Hittites. Hittites for a hundred. Four hundred shekels of silver, shekels of silver according to the weight current among current among the merchants. So, Ephron Ephron's field in Machpelah. Machpelah. <laughs> Near Mamre. Near Mamre. Both the field and the cave in in it, and all the trees with the border of the field was deeded <laughs> to Abraham as his pro property in the presence of the Hittites who had come to the gate of the city. So Abraham here is getting a, a piece of land that he's going to use for for a burial plot for for Sarah and ultimately for for him and how does he get this piece of land he works he pays for it he pays for it money that he had, had worked for huh again through what we would consider natural means so how does god give possessions god generally gives possessions by blessing us with the ability to work so that we can can gain those possessions And that includes, you know, two of the things that we give, get as, as gifts from parents or friends or other relatives and, oh, no. or things that, maybe that are given to us, you know, the, whether the government provides certain benefits and, and that. But all those ways that we would consider really natural means, huh? Allowance. An allowance, yeah. Uh, 
First Kings 21. The Lord forbid that I should give you the inheritance of my father. So how have Naboth gotten this vineyard? Inheritance. What's an inheritance? Like what, what you father get from um, if, if your parents die. Relatives. You know, something. So in this case, I suppose it was a gift, really, isn't it? Mm -hmm. An inheritance, especially, I suppose, is a gift that you receive generally when somebody dies. But do you necessarily work for it? No. No. Um, it's given to you of the kindness of someone. Matthew 7, verse 11. Ethan. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So here he speaks about gifts. Huh? Everything we have is a finding gift from God, but some of the things we receive are maybe gifts from, from others. So God blesses us with possessions as well through, through gifts. Generally he does it through things that we work for, um, our gifts and abilities. He does it generally though through, or sometimes through gifts. He could provide for us miraculously, couldn't he? But doesn't generally do that, and that's not something that we should expect uh, from him. Probably a good place for us to pause and have something to eat, and then we'll come back, we'll look at the things that God wants, forbids, first of all, in the commandments, that he doesn't want us to do, and things and ways that he wants us to use our possessions. So let's pause there, and let's go ahead and join together.